Well, dear people, we can see from the setup this morning, and most of us know the first day, first Sunday of the month, we will be coming and celebrating the Lord's Supper, and it is a delight for us to be able to do that. We come again here on this first day of the week, beginning this month with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We are prompted by our words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper points us to the instructions given to the disciples in the upper room. The commandment the, that commemorates, excuse me, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people. It is also a reminder what we went through, he went through for our salvation. The death, then the resurrection of the Savior, the basis which is the proof that our salvation has truly been accomplished. We look at the cross and we see what took place with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the proof of it that he was moved from the cross. And now he was even put into a tomb and he came out of the tomb. This is the proof. The Bible tells us clearly that what was done, though there was this putting him to death. And we know it was a mock kangaroo trial that found him guilty and put him to death. But we find and we know that our Savior is the true Savior of the world. And he is the one who brought us out of darkness and into his light. We have presently studying the I am's of Jesus Christ, which I hope you find them to be wonderful, glorious truths of Christ and how he goes to each one of them. I believe this morning it is appropriate for the preparation of the Lord's uh, table to even look at that fifth I am that we saw on last Lord's Day. In that I am, Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he closes that verse off with, do you believe this? When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was focused upon his death and his proving all, with all accounts, that the Lord's Supper in the Bible is the very thing that points to that. Every place we read of the Lord's Supper, Jesus makes it clear that what you're doing and what we're doing even here with the bread and the drink, it is that we're looking to the actual death of Jesus Christ. Matthew 26 and 26, take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Not just go through some ritual for the forgiveness of sin. Mark 14 and 24. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Luke 22, 17. Take this and share it among yourselves. Verse 19. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's all through the gospels, the reason why Jesus Christ died and what his death actually indicates. And even as we come to Paul the apostle in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and 25, he even takes up again what it is said about the death of Christ in the whole body itself. Turn to that passage with me. And notice how the apostle, what he says there, and you know it quite well, so we'll be just looking over something that we've read so many times already. He says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for I received from the Lord, and he's speaking that Lord Jesus Christ himself, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The very idea of the Lord's Supper is pointing to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to take us back to the important teaching of the fifth I am of Jesus Christ in John 11, 25 and 26, and where he says there, and notice if you turn to that passage, he indicates who he is and what it is he's about to do. You know the context of the passage, but Jesus says this in verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And these words I want to come and use again for us as we come and prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. And as we look at the Jesus have, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, we've looked at this and understood what it's all about. In a very historical account, what Jesus did, and he let his people know that after a while, that he allowed, he actually made it where Lazarus would die so that he could raise him from the death to prove who he was, and to even point to us that he has the power over death and life, even right now today also. The same Jesus then is the Jesus that we worship even today. And he said here, I am the resurrection and the life. And notice I've pointed out two particular powerful things to you, the two words, the resurrection and the life. The resurrection, when Jesus spoke of the resurrection, he was saying that he is the author of resurrection or that he embodies the resurrection. Furthermore, that he is the actual power of the resurrection. Jesus was stating that by and through him, the resurrection takes place. The subject of the resurrection is the return of life where there is death. Death is the result of Adam's sin, and we know that. Adam's sin caused the human race to be born into sin. And then a threefold death came upon all mankind at that time. That threefold death was seen. First of all, there was spiritual death. We were spiritually dead when we came into the world. At the point of birth, we had no spiritual connection with God so well. I heard a man preaching the day on the other day on the radio. He said, some people think that all people in the world are God's children. He said, that is not the fact. That is not it. Only God's children are those who Jesus died for. So God is not, everybody in the world is not God's children. The world loves that, and they want to say that, but that's not the truth. The spiritual death, that's what we receive even from Adam's sin. When we were born, we came into the world sinners. We were physically dead also. The process of the breakdown of the body takes place in us because physical death was here. Sin came upon mankind and man began on a track of dying physically. But then he says that the third thing we saw was there was an eternal death. What's going to happen when the plague of sin and death is on people? They will have this final impact when they experience eternal death. We're all going to die. The day is coming. Those who are not in Jesus Christ, they're going to go into an eternal death, never to have life again, always out of the very presence of God, never to see and to understand anything but God, but pleading and misery and pain. And that's the fact. That's the truth. Jesus proved with the resurrection of Lazarus that he had the power over death and life. But it was much more than having the power to resurrect the dead person. Jesus himself is the power. He was saying that he embodies the actual resurrection, or he is the actual power of resurrection, meaning that by and through him, the resurrection take place. Jesus said he is doing it. Jesus is saying that he, it is he who enters into the soul and imparts life into the dead person. And I'm speaking of right now in this life. 
every person, you and I, before we came to Christ, we were walking death in those three areas. Dead because we had no spiritual life, dead because his body was breaking down and going to the grave, and eternally dead, never to come and know anything about Christ. But Jesus says he had to move. He moved and he was the one. He did in resurrection power. He came. Jesus is saying that it is in him that in, enters all the soul and in the parts of life. He comes in. He breaks into mankind. He comes into a dead person. You and I, dear people, when we turn to Christ, it wasn't because we decided for Christ. He had to wake us up from death. He had to show us to his own process where we were and where we were going. And he was the one. Jesus is a supplier of eternal life with God. The life that the resurrection brings includes life now and life in the future. Life now means spiritual life. Oh, you and I can thank God that we have spiritual life. We know Christ, we know what it is now to have the true and living God who we, we serve. Life in the future is the glorious resurrection of the soul and eternal bliss with God. That is not going to happen to every human being on the face of the earth, whoever lived on the face of the earth. That's only going to happen to them that Christ raises from the dead. And the power of the resurrection which he shows is the way he's going to do it. How is this connected to the Lord's Supper, you may ask me? Pastor, you're going on with the resurrection, so how do I connect it? Well, what does the Lord's Supper focus on? What is it focuses on? What are we thinking of when we see two plates here and we see the articles in it? We see pieces of bread and we see cups in there. What is it focused upon? It is focused on Christ's death and resurrection, isn't it? Aren't we thanking God as we come to here to know that Christ died for us? He was and went in the tomb, but he came out. That's what the focus is, isn't it? You and I understand, and that's why this fifth I am is very powerful. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Meaning that his resurrection provides new life for all who would die and he will be the one who will bring them back to life again. Also, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Jesus is saying in that there's nothing that's going to happen to the one who has been now given that spiritual life in him because of what he has done, his death, his life and his death. Now there is nothing to happen to us. We don't have to wonder if you're truly a child of God, you know, and God's going to put it in your heart. You don't have to worry what's going to happen to you when you die. Now, granted, some people, Christians, can be a little failing in their faith and may have these times when they do that. But the Christian going to know, Jesus says, I am in you. I am with you. And he is the one giving us that assurance that we will live again. So when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he is saying, people will live Salvation through Jesus Christ gives resurrection life to his people. He makes it clear that there is a finality to the resurrection that the believer receives through his, that is Christ's death. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Very powerful words, dear people. Then he says, do you believe this? will never die. Do you believe this? And he speaks right to each and every one of us at that time. He causes us to go deep down in our hearts. See, we don't have this belief up here in our brain. It's not an emotional thing. It's not what we heard, and since what we heard it, we kind of process it. No, true life in Christ is spiritual life in us. And we believe that inside we move and we have our very being in Christ now because he has given us new life. 
And when he says, do you believe that? Really, I think it takes on more. Are you living that? Is that a proof in your life and of everything that causes you to continue on? And so Jesus is saying that you will never die. So we come, again, moving towards the Lord's Supper. What does it say? Luke 22 and 19, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus makes it clear what we have done, what he has done for us. When he says, this is my body, it ought to take us back to the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, no, first of all, he should take us to the cross, shouldn't it? And take us to the fact that he was not killed. Jesus is teaching them and us today beforehand, when he was there at the grave of Lazarus, he says, there, he said, this is the reason why I came into the world. To raise my people from death. The bread and the cup represents his body that was on the cross and his death for sinners. He died on the cross. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. Oh, dear people, here's victory. He came out of the grave. This is to make us to think of Christ and who he is. As real as that piece of bread we would take and that liquid we would drink, his resurrection is real. And your eternal life is real now. If you really believe in him. And this victory, it proves who raised Lazarus has the eternal power to raise his people from the threefold death of spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're proclaiming, you're shouting it as it were from the housetop that this tells me he died for me. But this doesn't cause us to bring in a place where we, he died for me and we hymn some horrible song because, oh, he died. But no, it shows us on the other side, he raised from the dead. And his death was the very thing that gave us eternal life. And we know now that's what has taken place. So here it comes to the supper. Why do we take it? And we take it because even Paul has told us the reason why. He said it was given to him by Christ what he must do. And Paul Christ says, this is my body, which is for you. And our minds, our emotions, and the whole truth should take us back beyond what we have in the plates there, all the way back to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done. Taking the Lord's Supper is shouting out the truth that Jesus died and has given me life. And that I live and will never die. He ends that very passage in John 26, 11, 26. Do you believe this? And that's a question that all of us should ask ourselves. Do we believe this? That is a question that you and I should look at. Do you believe this is your heart right now? And all things, it's in your heart. It's a part of you. It moves you. It keeps you. It causes you to go day by day in this wicked, torn sin cursed torn world and all that comes around you and even when the body is so broken down do you believe do your mind go back to this one thing you believe that you have resurrected life because of Jesus Christ do you believe this and it has made a difference in your life did it really? does it make a difference in your life dear people you see, just to come to the table, and so many has done it in, his, in history, just to go through a formality. And some believe that by taking it, they're going to receive something. 
But do you come to the table knowing that you are different? God has made a difference in you. Your life is different. The way you live, the way you think, the things you do, you do it for different reasons now. You're living for Christ and not for yourself. Do you live now for the obedience of Christ? Lord, what will you have me to do? Not Lord, put a stamp on what I want to do. That's different. Christ didn't die so that we can live our lives any old kind of way. Christ died to bring us to himself and to live for his glory, that he was going to give us all that we need, that we would live that way. <clears throat> oh, dear brethren, this life isn't easy. We begin our worship this morning, Lord, even over the past week, our brother prayed for us, Lord, forgive us our sins. Which one of us can say we gone through last week and we did not sin? We can't say that. Even a thought, even a harsh word. How do we react with one another? Yes. So we need to come and be reminded. And we need to see and understand that we have new life in Jesus Christ. But that new life has to be proven in us. Are we living up to what Christ did? You are no longer dead. You're no longer under the power of death and sin. Yes, Jesus tells us also, if we, don't, if we sin, ask God forgiveness for us and he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But every one of us have to see and understand. Everyone who has truly been saved and possess new life in Jesus Christ will never die. Have you ever thought about that, dear people? You're not gonna die. You, who you are right now, is going to live forever. And I believe in some case, we know we're going to take this body off, but we're going to have a new body. But I think we're going to be able to see each other and recognize one another, who we are. And we're going to be there with one another forever. And this is what it is. I did this. Jesus says, I gave my life for you. And the wonderful part about it is that I didn't scroll down the annuals of time and look and saw one here and say, I think I'll save her. And look and saw another one there. I think I'll save him. No. Before we were ever born, he chose you for himself. He had a love for you before anything happened. Even before he said, let there be light, you were already chosen. Shouldn't that make us say, Lord, help us to live to your glory. Everyone who has truly been saved and possessed new life in Jesus Christ will never die. Come to the Lord's table, dear people, not wondering if you're taking it right, but knowing because your heart says, I'm doing this because of Jesus Christ, my Savior. He loved me, he died for me, and I'm going to proclaim his death on my behalf right now by taking the elements from my heart and with pure and all complete attachment to Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And Jesus says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. If Jesus never raised from the dead, Jesus never died and raised from the dead, we would have nothing. We have life because of that. And I believe just pondering on those truths once again is the very thing that will help us as we come to the table, as we come and looking at Christ, and as we come knowing that Christ's body is what was put in the grave for us and came out of the grave and is now in heaven. And Christ says, I am in you. And when the Spirit comes, he will be in you also. Resurrected life has been given to us still, people. And when we come here, this is a time of celebration. This is a time of saying, oh God, thank you for what you've done for me. Not to look at it as some dull thing to go, 
I tell you, sometimes I think I wouldn't be so mad if somebody jumped up and started dancing. <laughs> the reality of it, and we won't, probably won't know the real expect, expectation of it until we come out of the grave. Well, basically, when we die and we know that, hey, that body is there, but I am with Jesus. And I think there's going to be a dance in it. Oh, dear people, this is what he does, and this is what he says. And he gives it to us, and he says to us, now do this in remembrance of me. And as remember, we don't remember some strange things about Christ, but remember his death on our behalf. So let us come to the table. Let us come looking at Jesus Christ and all that is there that reminds us he died, but he is alive. And he's given us life. Let us pray. Oh, blessed God in heaven, we pray that you would take what we do today, given to us by the Savior himself, that we should be those who would look to you, O oh Lord God, and give thanks for the mighty things that you've done for us. Men and women who are in the world, brought into the world, live in our lives of sin, but yet you rose us from that and you brought us to a place where we love you and we serve you. And it was nothing that we did. It was what you did. And you did this by your own death, Lord Jesus. So we pray now even help us as we are now in you, connected by the Spirit. Lord, let us come to this part of our worship service, giving our hearts and knowing, oh God, what you have done for us is the greatest gift that has ever been given and that we desire to worship you with all of our hearts, not only with this and coming to this very supper of remembrance at this time, but even saying for the rest of our days, we will give all glory and honor to you, our great King. So bless us now as we turn to the supper of remembrance. Hear us and guide us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.